Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 440. That's 440 para mi, Agostino Zynga. How are you doing? O conmigo? Is it conmigo or con me? I think it's conmigo. Whatever it is in Spanish. Hola, como estas, mi amigos? Cool. También? Great. Amazing. How am I? Doing great. Absolutely wonderful. You know, chilling, relaxing, doing the best that I can with the time I have available and just counting the time until we're allowed back in the gymnasiums, outside the clubs or inside to the clubs, outside to the real world, into the Primarks and all that good stuff. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like button, hit subscribe, turn on your notification bell, leave your comment down below and share the show. That'd be greatly appreciated. If you're listening via the podcast app, a five star review via the Apple podcast would be very much appreciated because that helps, you know, to bump up the show and the algorithm. So if you could do me a big favor and leave a review via Apple podcast, if you're listening via there, then please do so. If of course, you want to support the Patreon, the Patreon too. You're more than welcome to do that at patreon.com for just Agostino. I put a bonus episode up on there. I've got one there at the moment. My unfiltered views and opinions that I feel a bit, you know, self-conscious about publishing on my YouTube channel or stuff that I feel might potentially get me cancelled. I'm going to put it directly on the Patreon. So make sure you check out at patreon.com for just Agostino. That's patreon.com for us. A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. And get involved on there today. I'll be greatly appreciative of your support as ever. It's only one dollar the equivalent of one pound to support the show via patreon um all costs go directly to my beer budget and to buying better equipment <laughs> and of course uh, sponsoring my my acquisition of a new mercedes because after watching that drake video i need to step my automobile game up but yeah thank you so much for supporting the show as per usual it's been a pleasure to share my thoughts and opinions with you guys via the medium of youtube and podcasting with that malarkey it's actually been a great net benefit to my mental health and to my general um you know, outlook on life is kind of brightened up during this incredibly hard time to, you know, um, get things in order. As most of you are aware, I'm sure most of you or some of you are probably going through far worse times than I have gone through. But we are here together holding each other's hands, right? E-hands. We're holding each other's E-hands, if that makes any sense. I don't know what that is, but you know the vibes, isn't it? Hope you're well and doing good. Woo! So yeah, what have I been thinking about today? What have I been thinking about today? Many things, many things, many, many things. Number one thing I've been thinking about today, right, and I wanted to kind of speak about, randomly popped in my head, is I was thinking, will you still be watching DJ live streams, if you have been anyway, during, um, you know, the ones you've been watching during lockdown? Would you consider, would you continue watching them once you've, you know, wherever you live has opened up and you're able to go back to the quasi real world and you're able to kind of go to an actual club? Will you continue watching live DJ live streams? I'm a little bit in between. I'm not too sure. Again, I'm in a unique position because I can kind of see it from the perspective of a DJ, having, you know, done it for a number of years at a very low level. Don't get me wrong, bars and pubs around my area, but still, it's something to hold on to. It's something. Um, I can see it from that side, and I can also see it from a punter, having done my fair bit of techno tourism. So I would say as an artist or as a DJ, I would be a little bit annoyed if I was playing somewhere in a club and I was told that my set would be recorded because even for myself, and I've recorded a few sets at Pirate Studios, Big Up Pirate, and they have uh, these amazing self-contained studios that you can basically hire per hour um, with, you know, up-to-date equipment that you will use in the club. So it's a great place to go and practice or to go and record the DJ mix. Um, I've done plenty of live streams on there that I pre-recorded some that I've done live. It's really a great resource. Um, <clears throat> and like I say for my own self, having spent some time in Pyro Studios recording, it really does change the dynamic of how you play. Even when you're on my, I'm on my own, like I'm by myself usually when I go and record. When I go with friends, of course, it's different. But when I'm on my own, that's when I record. And, and I feel, I won't say nervous, but you change. Something changes in you because the camera's on. I guess it just is what it is. I guess it's similar to this podcast, right? I'm pretty much myself on here, but I'm sure I play up to the camera to some extent. When you meet me in real life, maybe I'll be a little bit more reserved. I might have another, you know, tick that you haven't noticed. But there's something that you do once the camera gets turned on. And even more so, I would imagine, in the pack club, knowing full well that the management's recording it, knowing full well they want you to provide them with a good show so they can share it, knowing full well how clips are, you know, um, how people sort of respond to clips online, comments on YouTube, comments on Instagram, hate comments on Twitter. You know how social media is. All this will be playing in your head as you're playing. 
and it's probably not conducive to playing a good DJ set and it's not conducive for the punters, the customers for having a good night. I would imagine so. It's sort of equivalent, I would say, to like those really overcrowded and um, bro boys club um, DJ booths that you see at DC 10, right? There is a side of it that, you know, some people would say, oh, the only reason why you're criticizing that kind of stuff is because you're not there yourself. Cool. I get it. Maybe. But there also is an aspect where you kind of feel gr weirdly uncomfortable because you know yourself having played how um, uncomfortable it is to have people just hovering around the DJ booth, especially if, the, you, if you don't know them. It's one of the worst feelings, right? Because usually it's a sign that you're meant to wrap up the night because it's the bar manager telling you to like, you know, wrap it up, last song. Sometimes it's also an indication that you're doing a terrible job and the manager checking in on you to make sure you're not high on crack. Or it's just really distracting to have somebody standing off, you know, in your eye, in your, out of your line of sight, just staring at you or looking at your screen or something of what you're playing. It's one of the worst things. It's probably one of the, the most annoying things I've ever experienced in a DJ booth. It's one of my ultimate pet peeves, right? People coming over and just like, relax, chill out, right? Just dance, do whatever, but let me do my thing. Even if you think I'm playing terrible, like, let me do my thing and then you can come and recover the night or do whatever you need to be done. So um, I feel uncomfortable watching people standing in DJ booths at DT10 watching other people play, let alone myself being in that position. Then I switch it to the customer's point of view and I think to myself, part of the reason people actually go to clubs, I think, again, I don't know about kids, I don't know, I haven't spoken directly to children because I'm not Crystal Lear, but I would imagine a lot of the young kids at the moment now, when they see these clips on these... Um, uh, electronic music meme pages i'd call them or blogs right uh these sort of like a uh, drops banger um you know arm to dixon which is obviously mostly centered on inner vision but there's a few of these little um instagram pages right up around it right where people basically regurgitate the same you know 10 to 20 clips of djs playing in places but i'm assuming a lot of it has, has to kind of be worked in with pr i'm assuming a lot of pr companies reach out to them send clips of djs on their wrestlers or booking agents to help them get more gigs because we all know the story of, of jada g right she mentions where she didn't really want to do deck mental because they record sets and she's really uncomfortable playing in front of people um she gets you know weirdly um sexist comments on youtube because she's pr pretty much quite an attractive young lady i guess so you always receive like really nice complimentary messages and i'm also assuming you're going to receive some really toxic messages too because if there's anything i've learned about um youtube mate um the chin the, the chin strokers began on youtube they really have something they really have an instagram when it comes to female djs like those guys i don't know what it is whether or not they've been rejected by a bunch of girls in school or they generally think women can't dj they really have a visceral reaction when they see a woman on the screen so naturally jada g was quite nervous about you know um doing a live stream for deck mantle she eventually got persuaded to do it. Um, I think it was part of the boiler one. I think it might have been one of her first ones. The one where she's sort of like on a thumbnail, her hair's like going all over the place, right? And it's got, you know, m m the last time I checked, it maybe had a quarter million views. I'm not sure how many it has got now. And she says, I think in one interview, I forgot, I think I saw it, maybe electronicbeats.com. But I remember her saying that, oh, that, that um, set she did, even though she didn't want to do it, was the set that really propelled her career. It took her to the next level. Even though she's a great she's a great producer, great artist, um, a pretty pro a proficient DJ for somebody that plays the music that she does, playing on vinyl, like she's really good. But still, that performance on Deck Mantle is what really took her to the next level. And I'm sure a lot of people, customers also, found out about Jada G, specifically because they said, oh, who's that mixture girl with a big curly hair playing, you know, at Deck Mantle. They listen to the set like, oh shit, she's not just like, you know, um, there for the show, there for the image. She's actually really good. And then boom, you dig into a story, da, 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 da. then you go and follow her on tour, you see her playing in the club somewhere. So I'm sure a lot of kids see clips on these um, internet, or these, sorry, these social media meme pages or whatever, and base a lot of their buying decisions on who they kind of resonate with. It's probably not the best thing to do, but it is similar to what I did. I only say best thing because I, I think, you know, having any sort of idea of what a DJ plays from a minute clip you see on Instagram probably isn't conducive, right? To having a great night. Don't get me wrong. And a lot of it has to, doesn't have to, a lot of it just not only in the DJ, it falls on where you're going to go see them, the club, the time of year it is, where you are at your stage of life. Loads of things kind of play a factor into you having a good time or not having a good time. But I remember when I was first getting into electronic music, part of the thing that I used to always do was that sometimes I'd like do this odd thing where I'd be like, especially back in the day when RA had a comments section still, easily one of its best features. And um, when they used to do the DJ polls early, um, the numbers between like 30 and downwards, 30 to 100, were really reflective of like the scene and what people kind of liked and who performed well in clubs. And you and you basically click on a random DJ, let's say Move D or something, and you click on his name. And then... um. 
you'd find a set he played in Croatia or something. Someone mentioned some other DJ in the comments and you go on their page and essentially you'd find these little clubs all around Europe, right? And what I'd do is I'd kind of, you know, put a very prominent DJ's name and I'd put the club onto YouTube, um, search it, uh, sort it via date added and you see all these videos that people are uploading. This is prior to social media also, right? You see a lot of people adding videos, uploading videos of uh, DJs playing at certain festivals or clubs and then asking for track IDs. That was big at that time, right? Or oh, track ID. Da -da 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 -da. Move D playing at this random race somewhere in Romania track ID please and someone write a comment duh, 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 duh. and this is before Shazam was really prominent so um that was the way I discovered a lot of DJs through that kind of thing so you're kind of it was sort of like what people are doing now with Instagram stories before they changed their you know settings before you could go on Instagram dis dis discovery tab I think whoever for a location and you could basically check through people's stories and see what people are tagging in real time so it gave you an idea of what the club looks like who kind of goes there the sound it kind of just gave you a bit of a voyeuristic you know view on what was going on now they've taken away that feature i think um from what i understand the reason why they did that so people can engage more with stories so they're not going on other people's stories i don't know blah, 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 who knows um but i think a lot of people definitely find their favorite dj via those instagram um electronic music blog pages for sure so if you're an artist, you're in a bit of a you're bit in, you're a bit in, you're in like a conundrum, aren't you? Because on one side, recording your DJ set is definitely going to change the way you play. It's going to affect you some way, right? Whether you know it or not, it's definitely going to change how you play. It's going to affect the night, whatever it's going to be. But you also know this could really set you up in terms of securing some of your gigs, you know, for the next six months of the year, wherever it may be, right? Um, or it might completely, you know, it might put you in the in in front of certain people. It might kind of bring certain attention to you, allow you to maybe, you know, whatever it may be, the certain opportunities that you're going to get via having that kind of, you know, um, virality of a clip go online somewhere. There is something in it. So it's a weird conundrum to be in. Um, again, I think from a purely customer point of view, knowing there's a camera staring in front of a DJ is going to make you, I don't know if you'll even, even notice if you're, you know, actually on it. You probably won't notice. You'll probably be spending too much time in, a, in the toilets of a club to notice anything's going on. But I don't know, man. Like, I also think about Boiler Room, right? I think Boiler Room, the reason why Boiler Room was special at the time that it first sort of launched was that you got, especially, you know, no, let's say, let's say the second phase when it started to go into clubs and stuff and festivals, it was good because you got like a little, peek into local scenes especially when they decided to go to you know far-flung places in the middle east places in far east asia south america places in africa it gave you an idea of what was going on there because you never got to see if you weren't really curious and you weren't digging in you never got to see that kind of thing obviously then it got and kind of got bastardized and the, and the sponsorship jumped in and now it's just turned into basically one big branding or marketing exercise but at the time the spe the, the the gold that's on boiler room was that you got to see all these people that you could kind of I'd see yourself in like enjoying the music that you like, discovering tracks, seeing how people respond to stuff, what people are wearing. It was bloody amazing, right? And I think, again, a lot of that, um, a lot of, you know, Boiler Room probably shining a light on those local scenes allowed certain artists to basically propel their career to the next level. Um, so they probably owe a lot to that kind of platform. So it's a strange one, right? Again, because I'd imagine a booker, a, an agent, a manager would probably want you to record your set in a club because that means they're going to get more money because that means you're going to get more gigs, more inquiries, going to mean more dollars in their pocket. But for the artist, it's definitely going to cheapen, not cheapen, it's going to change how you approach the work. They say that, not cheapen. It's going to change how you approach the work. Um, like I said, because I've noticed it myself recording DJ sets at home, even in studios and stuff like you put the camera on it, it just changes you it is what it is we can't help it i don't know what what, what it does to people but um let me know in the comments I man what do you think will you be will you still watch dj streams once the clubs reopen um or will you do like most people because i've seen anywhere even the numbers of places like united we stream um uh, how you've pronounced hall berlin radio that's gone down boiler room numbers are i don't know the lowest i've ever seen in my life but that might just be because people have kind of been put off of boiler room with all the kind of you know funding scandal thing they were involved in i'm not too sure but the numbers across the board look like they're a bit low and i don't see any people sharing as many clips as before people aren't really you know screaming from the rafters that they're playing somewhere and boasting about it i don't know I, i'm seeing the kind of the interest dwindle a little bit maybe it's streaming fatigue maybe it's just my bias because i'm not tuning into it so i'm not seeing it on my feed anymore and their algorithms changed i don't know i'm just a random guy in east london chatting shit so yeah let me know in the comments down below what you think of that one ba 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 what else you have today mm. talking about clubs and going out <clears throat> there seems to be a little bit of a naivete creeping in with people regarding this idea of covid vaccine passports um 
of course, no one wants to have a COVID vaccine passport. It's a flipping horrendous idea. Um, you know, you open the door to, you know, some very draconian invasions of privacy uh, laws coming in, you know, surveillance, you know, um, 24 hour surveillance of every single movement you do justify, justified because they want to stop the spread of a pandemic, quote unquote. So it obviously does open the door to many messy things. But I think if there's a real, from what we've seen so far, and from what I've read, it's very interesting. It's very, it was very surprising to me, very illuminating, just how interconnected we actually are in Europe and how dependent most European countries are to affluent, let's say the more affluent countries coming over to their country in order to summer, right? You look at places in the Mediterranean, for instance, places in Central Europe, um, you look at the Croatias, the Bulgarias, the Hungries, a lot of their tourism basically props up their entire economy, right? And that tourism coming from, you know, neighboring countries and also countries such as myself, where I'm based in, in England. And um, we depend, uh, a lot of those governments, um, GDPs could depend, or those nations' GDPs depend a lot on that tourism coming in. So without it, they're pretty much handicapped, right? In terms of providing services and, you know, things for their actual citizens to enjoy um, and for them to have like a really prosperous life in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, the tourism economy too, I'd imagine, employs a huge majority of people in some of the more less affluent places across Europe. So there is a real need across the board, right? From governments here, governments abroad to just get things back open up again because, that's the only way people are legitimately going to be able to survive and put food on the table and whatever it may be. And of course, it kind of takes away the responsibility from the government for providing those things for the country because it's then going to cause a deficit in the spending that they have, bloody blah, blah, blah. So it seems like it's inevitable. It does seem like with everything pointing the way it's pointing, you know, with us living in a capitalist society, I just don't see any other route apart from this thing being the thing. And again, I'm sure the UK government are going to be very clever and be like, hey, we're not the ones stipulating you have to have a COVID vaccine passport. It's the countries you want to go to. So if you actually have wanderlust and you really want to go on a holiday and you're gagging to go on the beach, you really want to get a tan, you really want to sit somewhere and just, you know, order flipping pina coladas, you know, you want to have some fried calamari um, on some open seating outside of a Madrid cafe somewhere. You really want to be out there. You really want to be traveling. Well, this is what you're going to have to give up, right? You're going to have to give up some of your civil liberties, some of your privacy, um, some of your data, um, some of your medical information that you probably would, ne would have never shared prior. You wouldn't have been bad. And you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have even considered sharing it prior to this. This is going to be one of those things. Um, but I don't know how comfortable I am with it. I have to be honest. I would much rather live in a world where everyone just gets vaccinated um however long that takes people just you know uh travel inland you know there's plenty of places that you can go here in the uk of course none as good as places like barcelona lisbon porto flipping you know even uh zagreb right i'm sure we don't have as many great places such as that but there's definitely locations that you can go to where you can have um, some semblance of a holiday and then once everyone's been vaccinated and the world reopens and it's a bit more you know, the climate is changed and you can enjoy yourself a little bit more without having to give up some of your privacy and information. And maybe it will be a better option to go abroad. But I don't know. I'm not too sure. But this is a report here for The Sun that basically speaks a little bit on it. Let's play the clip here and let me know what you think. The European Union is preparing a vaccine passport scheme which would allow British tourists to enter Europe this summer. In a move which will bring joy to millions of holidaymakers, the European Commission will propose legislation for a digital green pass allowing for nations to open their borders later this year. For Brits looking to travel abroad over the summer, um, it looks increasingly likely that some form of vaccine passport or digital health app is going to be an absolute necessity. Um, now, it might not be that you have to have been vaccinated. What the EU are looking at is um, some form of digital health pass that stores all of your information. So that could be a vaccine certificate, but also a negative COVID test or um, a notification that you've had COVID recently and therefore have got immunity built up through antibodies. Um, so there's not just one particular vaccine and that's it. Brussels plans to have a scheme in place for the end of June, which could mean Brits who have been vaccinated will be able to freely travel to European countries as either tourists or for work. The digital passports will also include data regarding your latest coronavirus test results and your level of antibodies for the virus. This means you may not have to have a vaccine to enter Europe, 
If, for example, you can prove you have built up immunity via antibodies and have tested negative before travelling. The UK has confirmed it is working with international partners on vaccine passport schemes, which will likely be introduced by nations around the world as borders begin to reopen. Spanish officials have said if the EU scheme cannot be agreed, they will look to negotiate bilateral agreements with countries such as the UK to open up the Spanish tourism industry in time for the summer. Stephen Edgington, The Sun. Like I said, man, slippery, slippery slope, innit? Um, again, I think probably the most sensible option would just be to like wait for everyone to get vaccinated. I guess if I was giving anyone advice, it would be just to wait till everyone gets vaccinated and go from there. But I get it, man. People have been indoors for ages. People are, if you're, again, if you're willing to do so, then I don't see an issue with it. It's just more so if it kind of gets demanded of you. Um, that's where it sort of comes to get it gets a little bit tricky for me where you're sort of like you know legally obliged you have to carry this thing you have to go and give up your information you have to allow the government to basically analyze your medical details gather whatever want to gather and again in the future what's stopping them from doing far more draconian things such as this so i don't know man i'm not too sure how comfortable i am with stuff like this but you know i guess this is a situation in the life we're living in at the moment considering all things and where it's currently pointing Next on this, what do we have here? Oh, we have Square have purchased an ownership stake in Tidal. Did you hear about that? Um, this news broke, what, a couple of days ago um, via Twitter, actually. Um, Jack Dorsey and um, Jay-Z, Mr. Sean Carter, obviously, um, debuted the news on Twitter, which was quite cool, actually. Um, they sort of gave their press release direct, or they spoke directly to the customers via Twitter, obviously, um, owned by Jack Dorsey, co-created by Joe, Jack Dorsey himself. Um and yeah, interesting, isn't it? You don't really hear a title too much. I remember when it first all popped up on the scene, it was this whole idea behind it where they were kind of, you know, we're here for the creator, we're here to put money back in their pocket, give them ownership. Um, all of these people, they obviously that that presentation with, you know, Jay-Z, Kanye and a few other artists on stage, basically telling everybody that, hey, if you want, this is what you should be back in because these people need your help. The streaming companies are basically, you know, not really paying paying out really well for uh, the artists especially the ones that kind of occupy it's interesting right interesting it's interesting that streaming um you know dsps digital streaming platforms usually um fuck over for the most part the the artists on the lower rungs and also the artists at the top because if you think about it really especially consider this weekend Drake obviously dropped his um ep or his little free track pack right his free pack um scary hours too and I would imagine a lot of the traffic towards, a lot of the traffic on those streaming platforms was predominantly, especially when you consider hip hop is a number one genre. I think it's different if your genre isn't, you know, number one. But if hip hop is a number one global genre, then it could be argued if you're Drake that you are probably responsible for, let's say, half of the traffic coming to the digital streaming platforms, right, on the on the weekend, across the over the weekend, especially Friday, Saturday, Sunday, for sure, right. Um, you're definitely responsible for it. So you maybe should be getting a higher percentage or your rate should be different um, compared to somebody like myself. I just put up a tune there, right? I shouldn't be getting the same rates as Drizzy is getting because he's obviously um, commanding more of people's attention on those platforms um, at any given time than I am, especially just every day, right? I can imagine people listening to his tracks on, you know, all the way uh, throughout the entire week, for instance. So there is a weird thing going on and I guess Tidal wanted to kind of fix that. There was also that great thing they did where they have actual production credits on Tidal where you can actually check who actually made the track, who writ it, who produced it, who arranged it, who mixed and mastered. Really kind of geeky stuff that only music, some geeky music fans will like. But stuff that I kind of miss because you got that a lot on vinyls, right? That's why I loved have, buying vinyl at the time, especially when my turntable used to work. You go to like a record shop, a charity shop, you pick up a record, you read the sleeve, you'd find out some person that you've heard of on another track was featured on this track that you'd never imagined that they'll be on. That takes you down another rabbit hole then you find out the studio they recorded in you see the other artists that recorded in the studio like the vinyl i think kind of bred it just is what it is it's different now don't get me wrong nothing's good or bad but i think the vinyl era the cd era even it bred a different kind of music aficionado i know for myself like you know i used to buy so many cds i had like sleeves of cds especially when i used to first dj too there was like obviously a burning cd so you kind of had that tactile thing of knowing what your tunes were writing them on a with a flipping sharpie on the cds but I used to have like especially my dad actually had the thing a case 
a little thing where you used to put CDs in like a rack, right? Loads, like loads of stuff, like from anything from jazz to country to gospel, loads of stuff, R and B, just loads of amazing albums and stuff. And you'd be listening to them on loop because there'd be nothing else to listen to, right? This is prior to real, you know, streaming that we have now at the moment. You'd just be listening to the same album like seven or eight times. I think part of the reason why I know Boy in the Corner front to back, every track lyric for lyric is because I listened to that shit every single. That was probably one of the last CDs I bought. That or maybe one of Kano's albums, but I just had to listen to it every day. It's the only thing I had, right, to actually listen to that I actually rated at the time. So you got a bit more attached to the artist and you got a little bit more in-depth knowledge. You kind of loved it more. I don't know. It's just a different sort of appreciation. So Tyler did that. So anyway, let's look to the announcement. This is here for courtesy of Twitter. Uh, Jack Dorsey tweeted the following. Square is acquiring a majority ownership stake in Tidal throughout, um, through a new venture. With the original artist becoming the second largest group of shareholders and Jay-Z joining the Square board, why would a music streaming company and a financial services company join forces? He says, um, it comes down to a simple idea of finding a new way of artists to support their work. New ideas are found in the intersections and we believe that there is a compelling one between music and economy making the economy work for artists is similar to what Square has done for sellers. Yeah, and you've, have you seen Square has done really well, obviously. Um, I've, I've just been using Cash App at the moment. Check out my Cash App. Cash App is my whole name um so definitely check that out in the description if you want to send over some coinage you're more than welcome but cash app works really well the interface is fucking gorgeous isn't it i know a lot of people will use square for their little pop-up shops and stuff and markets that they go to and people have a lot of great things to say about it they're doing some really great work it'll be interesting to see how they approach this whole cash app with music situation if it is just going to be a cash app thing that'd be really awesome because i remember when they first launched they did a really cool influencer program where they essentially gave their dad a budget basically right there's a great way to acquire users because obviously if you worked in marketing which i've done in startups and stuff you'd know that acquisition of users you know and getting that cost down per user is one of the kind of you know um uh it's one of the things that people kind of focus a lot of their energy on and it's really difficult to do um through you know um standard uh marketing channels and i guess nowadays especially with some of the bigger startups who have a lot more funding they just siphon off money and just give it away as a way to kind of acquire users there's a company that used to do something every friday on twitter they was always kind of viral um, and then cash up did a really similar familiar thing where they similar thing sorry where they basically gave certain artists a budget and basically told them hey give away a certain amount on a specific day tag cash app um and it was great it kind of got it, it kind of now is part of the lexicon in similar to like paypal me um cash app has now kind of um joined that kind of group of things that people say when they request their money digitally over the internet it's really really cool i have to be honest um it continues here square started 12 years ago by giving small sellers a simple tool in order to participate with more fully um in the econo economy and grow we did the same with individuals with cash app which now enables a comprehensive set of financial services for folks who weren't able to access it before title started with the idea of honoring artists by being artist owned and led focus on the uncompromised experience for art it's refreshing and right the vision only grows stronger as it's matched with the more powerful tools for artists exclusive inclusive of new ways of getting paid given what square has been able to do for sellers in all sizes individuals through cash app we believe we can work for artists to see the same success for them and us we are going to start small and focus on the most critical needs of artists and growing their fan base which is flipping awesome isn't it because you imagine right for an artist cash up is going to be a game changer in the same way that patreon is a game changer for podcasters check out my patreon patreon.com for just agostino and the same way that substack is a game changer for writers because you get a chance to directly speak to the people who actually want to back whatever artistic output that you put out there and there's also no limit to how much you can actually make whereas if you work a salary job at one of these haloed institutions there's a cap to how much you can earn there's a cap to how much you can write about what you can write about and at what frequency whereas with these other platforms there's no cap and if anything you'd imagine it kind of brings me back to the um what gucci made once said in an interview i think with charlamagne when charlamagne basically asked him a question a lot of fans sometimes ask oh gucci especially at his heyday right are you maybe dropping too much music like maybe there's not a lot of quality control that goes into what you're putting in there putting out there because you're putting out flipping 12 albums per year plus mixtapes right and he said something that was really stuck with me like nah like my fans just want to hear from me regardless it doesn't matter if i'm rapping on a flipping you know um kids tv tune if I'm doing a freestyle on Instagram, they just want to hear from me. So if they want to hear from me, I'm just going to flood the streets. And then in that way, if I end up getting new fans, cool. But my actual fans, 
want to hear from me regardless. I was like, yeah, that's very, very true. Um, so I'd imagine places like Cash App and shit, if you're able to kind of make it work for yourself, then definitely I can see an untold advantage for, you know, growth, untold advantage in terms of earning potential. And obviously for the fans too, a direct way that you can kind of contribute and help them. Because that's also changed, I feel like. I don't know, I'm not sure what it is, but it does seem to be a different it seems that people are rooting for people. Like maybe it's because of the natural reaction to like the hate online in the same way that some people just get, you know, unnecessary levels of hate sometimes. Some of it's justified. Don't get me wrong. I think some people need to be honest with themselves and say, you know what? I'm quite a hateable person. I get why people will kind of, you know, make threads about, like you look at someone like a, a dark side feel, right? DSP. There's no way he can kind of, there's no way, unless you're a complete psychopath, that you can sit there if you're a dark side of field and say, oh, I have no idea what people hate me. You know why they hate you. Now, can they get overboard? Of course they can, but you definitely know you have a, a hateable um, sort of um, personality that rubs some people up the wrong way. But I also think a natural reaction to that is that some people are going above and beyond to make sure that the people they actually like know they like them. You think of how much, you know, Flagrant 2 podcasts people earn on flipping Patreon, right? Andrew Schultz and Akash and all those dudes. Like, it's like, last time I checked, I think it was like 92,000. Tim Dillon's show on Patreon earns like something like 52,000 per month. Like, people are Red Scare podcasts, something like 22 to 30 something thousand per month. People are really riding for who they're riding for, but then also they're doing the opposite and definitely hammering people they fucking hate. So it's a it's a weird place to be in but i think it's a natural reaction to it maybe i don't know let's continue here um square creator ecosystem and tools for certain individuals will do the same for artists and work entirely we'll work on an entirely new listening experience to bring fans closer together simple inter integration for merch sales which is genius modern collaborative tools and a new complementary revenue streams that's great i love the idea of um uh great tools for sellers individuals and also well sorry a new listening experience i wonder what that's going to be about um maybe it's the idea of like turning cash up into like an npr thing tiny desk where if you're watching these performances live you can sort of like tip the performer um similar to what people do in real life with busking because that's similar this, look this is so interesting right people would you would maybe look down maybe on the digital streaming age when things kind of went online you'd look down at somebody busking if you're an artist maybe oh my god man the, i don't know maybe you look down maybe you wouldn't i know i wouldn't as an, as a, as if i was an artist in that way in terms of singing i would see that as like a pure expression of art and also an opportunity for him to kind of go out and just acquire some users for free right it's because he's already got the stuff anyway all it costs him is a train ride him or her to go out and perform and maybe you might end up acquiring a new fan um sending out some good vibes that's kind of you know uh, you can't really put a value on that but it does seem interesting that we're definitely going back to the old days, right? We're definitely doing whatever everyone else was doing before, but just doing it online, right? People are basically busking. That's what they're kind of doing online, especially when they include stuff like tipping and shit. And then I thought, I remember for correctly, Bandcamp were meant to do something similar. I don't sure what actually happened to it, but Bandcamp were doing like a live streaming thing where you could basically contribute to a stream where someone's performing. And most of these indie bands that were basically struggling and able to un unable to perform due to COVID restrictions. So this is interesting. Um, it continues here to all of Tidal's current listeners and fans. Thank you for your loyalty and commitment to artists and their work. Tidal will continue to be the best home for music, musicians, and culture. That commitment to you is constantly is to constantly listen, learn, and work to make service you, that you love. Um, I'm grateful for Jade's vision, wisdom, and leadership. I knew Tidal was something special as soon as I experienced it, and I'm inspired to work with him. He will now help lead our entire company, including Seller and Cash App. That is insane. That is big. This is like a whole different level to then like you know Joe getting some fake title at Patreon. This this is really big like jace is sitting down with jack dorsey they're on the same level they're sort of peers at this matter jack, jay, jack is also jack dorsey did a really good thing in terms of embracing this idea or not embracing but basically in, yeah, embracing the whole idea of there, there being a black twitter because that kind of basically stemmed from this idea that depending on who you follow on your feed and with the algorithm that twitter have you can basically curate your feed to kind of peer into different communities like i have african twitter south african twitter um i have woke twitter on my thing because i follow some certain people you have black twitter in there you have the fashion you know intellectual twitter you have the streetwear twitter you have the dj twitter techno twitter sorry there's loads of different communities that exist and i think that was part of that was a conscious thing that they kind of um accepted because obviously it's going to be some good and bad it's going to be all the flipping uh what are they called groypers remember when trump was around all those kind of like a pepe the frog type of community people there on there they can be a bit annoying there's obviously the kind of contrarian crew that just you know um sorry the the hot takes crew that just want to you know go con constantly go viral with these fucking dumb hot takes that they put out there no one asks for but 
I think he did well by basically embracing that. And then, of course, when um, it came to a point where he saw hip hop embraced Cash App, he definitely lent into it a bit more. And this is a this seems like a really good uh, marriage and link up, to be honest, all things considered. More on us soon. He put together a playlist and then Jay-Z also made a statement here. Let's read that. He said, um, I said from the beginning that Tidal was more about than just streaming music. And six years later, it has remained a platform that supports artists at every point in their career. Artists deserve uh, better tools to assist them in their creative journey. Jack is one of the greatest minds of our times. And our many discussions about Tidal, endless possibilities have made me even more inspired about his future. This shared vision makes me more excited to join the Square Board. This partnership will be a game changer for many. I look forward to a new chapter has to offer. Allegedly, if you have been paying attention, Jay-Z supposedly made, what, 600 million in the past two weeks from his sale of obviously Ace of Spades and then this majority stake that he's selling. Uh, he's obviously given up to uh, Square. He's getting some stock and some cash options like, God damn it. That is an absolute come up. The interesting part of it, though, is the fact that, you know, he did preach a lot about black ownership and stuff. And now it's predominantly uh, owned by a Caucasian male. And so maybe there's some hypocrisy there, but I don't really think so. I think these companies are meant to be sold. You kind of build them up as a proof of concept to show that you can do this sort of stuff. You can operate on that sort of higher level. Um, you can sort of operate in those rooms and do whatever it needs to be done. Um, and again, proof of concept. Um, and now I'm sure Square is going to integrate Cash Up into it, make it a bit more of a seamless process process maybe improve its look its ui whatever it may be there'll be something there'll be a some sort of makeover that'll occur that'll basically prepare it to the next level going forward so it definitely makes sense in terms of a link up but yeah square buys tidal cash up integration coming very soon what else do we have here oh yeah so um talking about um the old vid oh that's nice oh refreshing Nothing like a good juice with some ice in it, innit? Ooh, refreshing. Okay. This is courtesy of Politico. It's an article called Trapped in Germany's COVID Nightmare. Interesting, innit, how badly um, Germany has basically dealt with COVID. When you consider, you know, people regard Germany as being a very efficient country. Um, they're, you know, very bureaucratic. Loads of laws and rules and stipulations and forms you have to fill out for all manner of things. Just trust me, ask anybody that's tried to rent an apartment, buy an apartment, or just stay in an Airbnb. The amount of hoops you have to jump over, jump through and jump in. And then also considering how well they kind of dealt with COVID in the beginning. Um, it does It does seem a bit disappointing to see where they're currently at, at the moment. There's a lot of COVID vaccine scepticism in Germany. Um, there's obviously a problem with getting the vaccines out in the first place. There's obviously a problem with supporting uh, people that are unemployed. Um, there's obviously a problem supporting the economy far out. It's just a whole bunch of issues. It's an it's a article here from Politico. It says, trapped in Germany, COVID's, um, Germany's COVID nightmare. Um, it says the following here. Let's read. Do, 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 span this a little bit so you can see it. Um, as the coronavirus pandemic raged through the United States last summer, an old school friend from Arizona wrote me a full of admiration for Germany's handling of the crisis. For years, he, along with other Americans, friends and family, drew boundless um, Schrodenfroden, um, imagining the daily difficulties I must face as an American among the supposedly humorless crowds. Uh, but now, as the U.S. struggle to cope with the pandemic, they looked across the Atlantic with envy, even humility. In contrast to the U.S., where uh, politicians had fumbled the pandemic response with from the beginning, Germany appeared to, as many Americans have done, everything right. By any measure... From the availability of PPE to the infection rate to the total deaths, Germany's handling of COVID-19 was far superior to the US's. How crazy it must be, my friend wrote, to be an American journalist in Germany watching from afar as the US basically falls apart. My German friend agreed. I was lucky, they told me, to reside in a country that functions one led by a trained scientist and not as an incompetent lunatic. But six months later, most of them spent, the, uh, spent in the confines of my home. I don't feel so lucky. It says the following. This week, Germany will enter its fifth straight month of lockdown do you know like we will definitely look back on this time i'm sure of it and definitely say that lockdowns just aren't worth it they're not worth the they're not worth the juicy squeeze they really aren't um in the long run um i think this is definitely a consequence of this must be a consequence of our over fetishization with youth the fact that we're all obsessed with youth the fact that everyone wants to be younger everyone wants to you know improve their uh ability to you know stay on the earth for longer all this sort of nonsense stuff we have no real connection or acceptance for death and passing over into a new life and moving on people are just kind of hell-bent on making sure that they keep their decrepit um pizza-filled bodies on this earth um wasting oxygen 
in people's time, right? So because of that, it only makes sense that when this virus came about, and of course, you know, the age of individualism, just think of stuff like Adam Curtis's hypernormalization spoke, spoke a lot about that. People just generally think that their life matters a lot more than it probably does to the wider world right especially when you consider you know the many civilizations that have risen and fallen throughout time we generally do tend to think that we have a really overinflated sense of self so when this vaccine came about it made sense that everyone was in preservation mode right people wanted to make sure that you know grandparents didn't die no one in the family died and you got these terrible stories of people passing away and having to flip and have their limbs amputated just horrendous stuff right but in general, again, not to be macabre, but in general, when you actually add up the amount of deaths in the global population, you know, it doesn't account for that many people really in context, when you think about it, especially when you consider it's an airborne virus that's pretty much impossible to stop the spread of. You could obviously contain it to a certain extent, but stopping it, you know, uh, that kind of zero COVID approach might work for some islands here and there, but in general, for how interconnected we are, especially in parts of Europe, it just doesn't seem like it's feasible. So there just was this, there is one of those uncomfortable conversations you're going to have where you have to be like, hey, how many deaths are we willing to accept for us to have a, a functioning economy, for us to have people that aren't suffering from mental health issues, for us to have people who aren't suffering you know, from being desolate and being alone for you know this prolonged period of time? Like, it just isn't worth it. It just seems like it really isn't worth it. Or if you do do it, you have to do lockdown properly in the beginning. You can't do this sort of, like, hands offish. Oh, what was what, what Boris Johnson saying at the time in the UK? Um, common sense, right? Um, the Great British public will use their common sense. No, you have to come in with draconian laws. You have to really put your foot down. You have to invent some new legislation. You have to do whatever needs to be done to make sure people don't move. That's all you can do to actually stop it at the beginning. And then from then on, you just have to accept the, the deaths and whatever else comes and the spike in cases. Because in general, long term wise, we forget this virus is one thing, but the consequences of it after in terms of the real world are going to be felt for years to come. It says here, da, 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 with no end in sight, though infection rates have declined in recent weeks, it remains unclear when schools and shops, not to mention restaurants and bars, will reopen. Amid the uncertainty, many small businesses across the country are facing ruin. Such fears, coupled with frustration over seemingly never-ending restrictions, have soured the nation's mood. The US, meanwhile, is turning a corner. Schools are slowly reopening. Unemployment is falling and the economy is slowly and slowly rumbling back to life. America's visceral optimism, which has always befuddled Europeans, of course, definitely. <laughs> optimism for the sake of it has begun to reemerge. The reason for this reversal of fortunes can be explained in a single word. Vaccines. Um, and then, of course, there's this really other good article here from ex Berliner talking about it. This is a really heartbreaking one. It says the Great Depression, Berlin's millennials in crisis. Um, this is the following. In another time, Hannah um, might have been a poster child for New Berlin. Since moving to Hapstada, right, is how you pronounce it, from her native Hungary five years ago, the 33-year-old hairdresser and makeup artist has worked tirelessly to build a creative career, freelancing from a range of theatre and film productions. Her business improved, she could finally afford to rent her own apartment. And early last year, she took the plunge. For the first time in her life, she had said she had her own place. Quote, I had moved away from home for school at the age of 18, where I lived in a dorm and then shared an apartment, she remembers. Coming to Berlin, I couldn't afford a space to myself at all. So I was moving from WG to WG. I know that hassle. Finally, I got to a place in my life where I could afford to pay for an apartment on my own. And I loved it. She just imagined the amount of these stories I've heard. And so it's insane how many of these stories I've heard from other people um, across, especially across the UK, most so in London, but it's a common thing where people had, I don't know what happened, maybe because it was, it was 2020 thing and people wanted to make change, but the amount of people that put down, you know, deposits for mortgages, went, you know, and moved across the country, set up a business and then bang, COVID strikes and it's like... Whew. Shortly afterwards, the first um, shortly afterwards the first lockdown um, was announced. The novelty quickly wore off, giving way to loneliness and depression. Hannah found herself alone in her flat. Now, a year later, in the virus second wave, the daily news narrative of the fast spreading corona mutations, Hannah is feeling is feeling sorry, seriously hopeless. She has been searching for a therapist for six months, but Berlin's mental health services seem to be overwhelmed with high demand. Since hitting a low point at Christmas, eating pasta alone in an apartment while everyone she knew was with loved ones she has been considering giving up on Berlin and moving back to her parents place in Hungary how depressing is that this is kind of one of those things that really is one um kind of um 
I guess a consequence of living in such a hyper connected city with such a thriving scene and community of kind of young people is I could imagine. I think the same occurs in London. London's a bit different because London people are a bit more out. I wouldn't say stuck up, but scene wise, people are a lot more uh, clicky, right? They tend to keep themselves to their friendship groups and the people that they know, um, especially if you try and get into, you know, don't even speak about trying to make friends in fashion and in music and shit. It's hard to break in. Once you do break in, it's fine. People are lovely, but it's hard to kind of crack in. Whereas in Berlin, it feels like people are, or in Germany, people are a little more open. They're willing to kind of accept more people where do you come from they want to share no just whatever maybe it is just better but i could also i can also i could also imagine on the flip side it could also be a very lonely place when you have no real friends right you can be really hyper connected you could go to a park and you know jump from house party to house party and afters to afters but i could also imagine if you don't if you're not that social it could be very lonely because who's going to come and find you and you know who how are you going to meet people if you're not going out and shit it can be very very lonely place i can imagine so definitely um see where she's coming from here she said yeah hannah's story is not an isolated case while the physical and economic costs of the pandemic are clear countless berlins are also suffering from various forms of psychological hardship often in private and often to an overwhelming degree mental health professionals are now sounding the alarm about corona's long-term long-lasting emotional damage in doing so they're identifying a surprising group of at-risk berliners not isolated seniors or homebound school children but people in their 20s and 30s above all singles those from outside the city it might seem counterintuitive that a demographic usually seen so young and carefree privileged um would uh have would face a heavier psychological burden from the pandemic but the very flexibility that makes millennial well in Bella, how you pronounce that word while berliner life to be so romantic can very quickly turn sour particularly when the pandemic blocks off persons usual sources of belonging companionship and income of course like i said um it just becomes harder to get but of course like if part of your lifestyle i remember once staying in an airbnb when i was in berlin right um this was when i was doing my whole technical tourism thing, maybe a couple of years ago it was a great probably the be best apartment i stayed in i usually I always kind of stay in my own place i rent like a, an apartment somewhere i don't know i'll go to somewhere you know corny like like Neuklon or whatever and stay there right and just you know get an apartment to myself a little one bed so I don't know you know so I can come in when I like and shit so to, you know it's a bit awkward when you stay in people's houses and you have to like walk past their living room and <laughs> shit <laughs> oh you're doing whatever you're doing in your bedroom and they can hear you and shit can get a bit weird so this one time I did stay in a shared accommodation. It was really cool. Everyone was flipping amazing people from all over the world you know making it happen in you in Berlin um I remember waking up and kind of, I've no, I came back from a club. No, I woke up actually to go somewhere. No, I woke up here yeah, to go get breakfast, go get some eggs. And the guy that was staying there was just like sleeping on a couch. He had nothing to do. He was getting good benefits from the German government. He told me how much he got. I was like, bloody hell, popped my eyes on my head. And he just basically is an artist who just, you know, goes to lounge around in his home, in his boxes, you know, just sleep with the, with the window open, sun beaming on his face and just chill. That was his life. And then I imagine later on, he'd probably gather his stuff, text his friends, find out what the motive was, go to a local bar where his friend worked at, pay half price on drinks, go maybe to a club somewhere, score some free drugs, hang out with people, go to an after. It's like a great lifestyle, right? But again, when that, but, the, but then people underestimate how much the importance of those kind of things to people like that, right? That's their fuel. That's what gives them a reason to live. It might seem a little bit, you know, it might seem a little bit, uh, what are we called, rudderless, or it might seem like it's lacking in, in, in overall, I don't know, like a goal they're aiming to reach, but that is a lifestyle that people should be allowed to live and to be allowed to exercise and kind of enjoy. And the moment that that kind of gets cut off, it kind of really makes you question why you're even there. Because part of the reason why you're, why you're there is that you're kind of, you know, you go to Berlin and places like that, it's not the most beautiful place in the world, right? It's not Paris. And you're kind of giving up that kind of visual beauty for the access, for the community, right? For the unbounded potential of your night, right? I always say Berlin, similar to Madrid, similar, I'd say, to Barcelona, similar to maybe not Paris, it's kind of similar, kind of, but you have to be the right group. I think Berlin is probably one of the most, the best spontaneous city in the world, right? You can legitimately be at a house party or at a rave and then end up somewhere random that you never even knew existed based on who you met in the toilet, right? It just can change, right, at, at a flip of a coin. Whereas in London, it kind of feels a bit like, unless you know the people that you're going out with and you know where you're going and you are familiar with the places that you should be going to and all this sort of good stuff, you're going to be limited on what you can kind of enjoy. It continues here. Um, like many single Berliners, Hannah has found it challenging to live alone during a pandemic. She has been she had been thrilled at first and even when the lockdown was announced, she dedicated herself to 
decorating the space. Everyone did this, isn't it? Remember people baking bread? Where's all the where's all the bread bakers, isn't it? On Instagram. Where are you? People used to bake bread. People that used to get dressed up. Oh my god, it's Friday night, so I'm getting dressed up. People that used to do those really cringy diaries. Day one hundred and the, the, the lockdown. Where are you now? Where are you? Where are you? Um, for a while, I was making things pretty. She said I ordered plants, hung them in my handmade macarons. I sewed with new curtains. With work on pause, Hannah enjoyed catching up on television and books, trying out new recipes and developing an exercise routine. She spoke to family and friends on Skype and went on walks with acquaintances from work. It was all looking good, she remembers. But then at some point, it just became harder and harder to get out of bed. And I gradually stopped all the activities as I was doing. I suddenly realized I didn't really have any friends here because I was working so much anyway. Suddenly nothing made sense and that honestly is true i know for me that was the main thing i was meant to again it's so odd in how this is i was always a kind of guy like thinking okay if i have more time to do the things i need to do i'm going to keep on doing them but actually i choose to do the things i want to do with knowing for what the world is reopened right but when the world isn't open and then i have to do the things i have to do it then becomes a chore so for instance reading working out um, learning a language, uh, drawing, writing, all these things I was doing prior when I had many things going on. I had to go to the office, I had to be at certain places, right? Like, I was doing them, right, at a high level, right? Constantly flipping, grinding my ass off, sleeping four hours a night, waking up in the morning at six to go for a run, going to the gym after work, you know, then going to go DJ somewhere in a club for flipping four hours, uh, come back home again, sleep uh, four hours, wake up again, go for work. I, my flipping, I was on, 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 on. The moment lockdown happened, pew, that all stopped. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Even though I have all the time in the world, I can do it whatever I want to do right now, right? Because I have no time time constraints. You you wake up in the morning, you work in the morning, you finish in the evening, but you finish exactly on the, you start at the time, you finish exactly on time. There's no one pulling you left and right. Your meetings on Zoom are perfect at the moment now. Even though it's a bit annoying, the good thing about Zoom is that they usually end when they end because you have to add more time onto the end of it. People are backed up with their meetings and shit. It's great, but I'm less productive. I'm, I'm, my extracurricular activities have gone completely down. I'm not doing any of the stuff I was doing prior to lockdown. So I definitely feel it here. She said here, um, as spring turned to summer, Hannah made an effort to fight her malaise, hopeful that things would soon be returning to normal. She found some work opportunities and set out to build a stronger friendship. She, had, she attended a picnic she used to turn down, reached out to people she knew from company, and after a week of recharging in Hungary, decided to find someone to date. A handful of Tinder and Bumble meetups came to nothing. However, and Hannah soon felt depression returning. I was trying so so bless her man she seems like she was really giving it a good go i was trying so hard but in the back of my mind i was already too gloomy she said by the end of summer i was back in bed not feeling ever motivated to do anything at all hannah ate a lot of junk food yep i'm here with you babes someday she'd left the bedroom to use the toilet she was thoroughly alone jesus christ some days she only left the bedroom to use the toilet god damn it man i feel her one night she says, I woke up from a dream where I was dead and no one found my body for weeks. God almighty. I've been there, man. Like I said, I'm the fattest I've ever been in my entire life because of lockdown. I'm going to say, uh, you go, oh, excuse me. No, bruv, honestly, I used to do two a days a week. Two a days, I'd do like three of them a day, a week, sorry. I would go in the gym at 6 a.m. in the morning. I'd then come back home after work and I'd run a minimum of three miles, right? consistently three days a week under the time of like I don't know, 25 minutes or something like that right so i'm going at a pretty decent pace eight minutes or something lower right per mile pushing myself then i'd work out in the evenings i'm sorry i work out on the weekends too sometimes you know a couple of hours on a saturday in the gym again sometimes i'd love to do it because i'd like to give myself a little bit of a i'd like to put myself through some pain so that i can enjoy the night out later in the evening and not feel so guilty about getting fucked up whatever it may be and now pew, stopped I was going to order a kettlebell at home, but I'm not doing a kettlebell in my apartment with carpet and shit, steaming up the... It's just, it doesn't feel the same, do you know what I mean? It continues here. The day after her disturbing dream, Hannah decided to seek help. She immediately began looking for therapists online. So they messaged a number of suitable looking practitioners she found via the Association of Counselors and Therapists website. She said, and I quote, I was proud of myself for taking this step, she said. Hannah had battled depression from her teens and 20s, but it was a taboo topic back in Germany. She said, I was happily thinking that in Germany, you'd be getting so much support of mental health issues, but boy, was I wrong. Hannah got no response from her first round of messages when she broadened her search to English speaking therapists. She still failed to secure a place. I've contacted about 100 therapists so far. God damn it. Most of them don't even reply. And if they do, it's just a what say. They have no capacity for new patients at the moment i feel like i'm on the verge of breakdown that's a problem though i'd imagine a lot of it has to do with infrastructure cool but i'd imagine the demand and the strain on mental health ish, mental health institutions and practitioners now is on another level they are probably inundated with people who want to seek help 
inundated, inundated, right? They're probably on another level in terms of the requests that they're getting. So this makes complete sense, man. Um, second lockdown blues. Should we read the whole this? But yeah, you can read the whole of it. Um, it's on, actually, it's on Ex Berliner. I'll put the link in the show notes so you can check it out. It's titled The Great Depression, Berlin's Millennials in Crisis by Ex Berliner. Really good. This website's awesome too. I think I found a lot of really cool clubs on here. They had a really cool, um, they had a really cool, what do they have? Oh, they had a really cool, like list of clubs that you could attend. They had like a oh um, a list of clubs that you would only know if you're a Berliner sort of thing. The comments are funny. People are like oh why are you blowing up all the spots? But it's a really good site. I really recommend you check it out. Um, honestly, what one what a great article. Definitely resonates with me as to what's going on here in London and in the UK in general. So definitely check that out. Who next on the list? Oh, we have this. Butter Goods elevates. Um, classic skate Stiller works for latest collection. This is really cool, right? Uh, you know me, I'm a big fan of streetwear, but I'm also a big fan of companies that are just unapologetically doing exactly what they're doing, especially when you consider the allure of kind of tapping into the fashion crowd, right? Doing seasonal collections, capsule collections, going to Paris Fashion Week and all this stupid malarkey. Oh, is that, is that, um, okay, I need to take, turn this off. It doesn't matter, but Texas hopefully didn't keep hearing the text messages there. I'm sorry, I apologize if that happened. But anyway, people, you know, there's obviously a lure that seems to exist with some streetwear and skate brands where they kind of get the attention of the fashion crew, which probably because you know it's a lot of attractive women kind of reaching out to you and wanting you because of your sort of rebel sort of edgy ways. So it makes sense why they'd kind of want to you know um, acquiesce and be a part of it. But as a fan myself, it is concerning whenever I see my favorite streetwear or fashion or streetwear streetwear or skate brand deciding to do a flipping you know showroom somewhere in Paris, hanging out with certain people having their lookbooks taken by a certain photographer using a certain model as a using a certain person as a model um having girls posting pictures that aren't have any nothing to do with the culture and just because they're pretty for the sake of it it definitely is the start of the beginning of the end when it comes to that kind of thing but one company that doesn't do that sort of stuff is butter goods australian based company really really cool um i was a big fan of theirs prior mostly be um, in recent times because of their collaboration that they did um with dc the just calis right dc something right butter goods dc let me see if i can get up on here and show you what i mean i actually was meant to purchase these but i actually missed out and forgot and then by the time they did come around it was way too late but let me see if i can get up on it the Kalis og uh butter goods really really nice shoe man but you know they're completely sold out in most places but this is the one that they were actually on sale too look at them they're flipping beautiful right um gorgeous 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 shoe wear these with a pair of combat you know pants or bdus you know similar to what just Kalis would have worn back in the day but look how good those are absolutely gorgeous um skate shoe there nice white and blue tones you got this sort of like fade on the on the mesh as well butter goods on the tongue label there like just stupendous obviously the butter iconography in the back there with some bit of 3m as well as to make sure cars don't run you over as you're bombing down the street but honestly one of my favorites so yeah butter goods i've always been a really big fan of this is their latest collection um, it's, this is courtesy of Hypebeats. It says Australian brand Butters Goods is presenting a release of its first menswear collection of 2021 of a lookbook that ventures around the brand's hometown of Perth as well as around the west coast of the US. So let's see some of the stuff they have here. Buh, 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 buh. Really great camo jacket. Nice hooded tops, great t shirts as per usual, but yeah, just classic stuff in it. Nothing too crazy, but you know what you're gonna get nice tops, good jeans, good pants. Sorry, um, great little fleece tops. I like that track jacket there, that's really nice. Uh, great t shirts, of course, just awesome, well done stuff in it. They've obviously got those trousers that all the kids are wearing that's skating at the moment, really baggy, sort of Jenko style, um, you know what would you call them would you call them mum jeans i don't know what they are but regardless they're a very particular thing a nice flannel jacket shirt there with a zip that's really nice with some great little embroideries of cherubs there on the chest i'm a big fan of the just cool stuff man you know just easily worn cool stuff nice pullover hoodies probably with a nice weight to them 
a uh, great little section there of the pants half zips here i love that logo back to worldwide that jacket is definitely a win as well and that's definitely going to be popular this kind of camo utility jacket i don't know what you call them but nice little is that tree bark camo would you call that rainforest camo i'm not too sure really nice i'm not sure if he's got a free oh has that got a pocket in the back as well it's pretty nice as well right yeah it's sort of like a hunting jacket isn't it? a little bit really cool man i'm a big fan of this i think it looks beautiful oh some nice hats as well you know save the world save the oh is that um thing what's his name he looks a bit like um gianna right yanuichi no gino yanuichi gianna gino yanuichi just a little bit like him I like the hat yeah that that flannel was a win especially in that color i think i'd probably get in that color that color is banging sort of like a blue with a zip on it that looks really good yeah i think that's a win there that entire outfit might be a win maybe the hat might not be me because it looks like is that a brim or whatever the space between this bit and the top because i've got a massive head and obviously i've got this mad, mad amount of hair on my head but whenever i see a a, a, a a snapback like that it definitely leads me to believe that most likely i'm not gonna be able to wear it it's sort of got the similar sort of shape and style to like a supreme camp cap where it's sort of like even though it might have a lot of length on the side actually when you know the depth of it is pretty low and then it kind of means that you have to wear it up like that like a like a flipping um courier and of course i'm not a courier and i've always hated that sort of hat style thing anyway um oh this is nice with a sort of uh sun logo things on there really really cool yeah great so oh look at that tracksuit that tracksuit is banging with the panels all over it that is really nice isn't it yeah good stuff man they're really improving their out their output it looks like there's a lot of places things to tap into oh look at that shirt with the horses battling each other there i love that imagine if it was zebras i'll be all over that for sure this is nice man really really nice i'm a big fan of this yeah so check them out man but goods oh look at that got a little utility vest there also that might be the camo jacket is that just in black right i'm assuming yeah so it's definitely got you could definitely i think it looks the same to me where the pockets are i think it's the same as that tree buck thing we saw so maybe you can unzip the sleeves and use it as a little fisherman's utility jacket sort of thing obviously to put your rolls of film and you know your little notepad and whatever it may be when you're out there venturing in the streets what's this little thing hanging in between these oh, okay it's a shadow my bad saying to my man's crutch there oh but the panelled pants are nice man yeah the panel pants are nice the track suits are nice the hats looks nice hats looks a bit small but they look nice but yeah check it out in it but a good new collection is going to be with you when let's see what hype said in terms of release date uh coming out on march 6th so it should be out now already so definitely check that out but a good till the death of me next on the list here oh you know what i'm reconsidering buying a pair of salomons um the hiking shoes that i took the piss out of on a couple of the podcasts ago i seen this right um salomon xt4s advanced um is that what it's called Salomon advanced has been given the monochrome treatment yeah they look nice man in this sort of monochrome tone right you got a lot of whites you got a lot of silvers you got a lot of neutral grays they don't look like the most flexible shoes in the world. Maybe it's just me from my eye looking from the outside in. But they don't look like they've got that much flex. That might be a, a, a um, that might be done a thing done on purpose in order to make them optimal for you know uh, trekking and hiking all across the mountains and shit. Um, I've never really been a fan of the lace fastening system they have here with the little pulley thing. I like my laces, but again, I'll be willing to give that up if that meant swagging it out in a pair of these. But they look pretty decent. I'm not gonna lie, man. I'm kind of changing my mind on these Salomon shoes. Again, they're, the, they're probably up there with the most hipstery shoes of all hipster shoes. They're probably up there with my double sole Dr. Martins in terms of hipster trainers that people would tend to wear. But they're un, they're unapolog it's unequivocal that these look nice. You can't debate it. You can't really say they don't look nice because they do. But again, when you wear them, I always feel like people just assume you listen to NTS. <laughs> people assume you roll your own cigarettes. You go to Broadway Market. Um, you like that? What's that record store in South that everyone goes to and wax off of? And it's all, I don't know, but you know what I mean, right? There's a particular sort of person that wears this sort of thing. Like, you probably got white socks on. Um, you're probably wearing a very expensive jacket, Arterix, North Face, um, something of those kind of ilk. 
Um, you probably attend, you probably go to Cafe Oto more often than not to go see people perform, you know, noise experimental sets of some malarkey. There is something about the shoe that kind of really, you know I mean, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be associated with these people. I really do not. I just want to buy my shit and just enjoy it. But you just, you can't help but end up looking at these people because I guess everyone has the same sort of outfit, right? I'm thinking salvage denim some sort of tactical pants, whatever it may be, a nice outerwear piece, Arteryx, North Face, uh, Berghaus, Patagonia, some sort of outdoor brand, right? You're going to put on, maybe a, you'll find like an off-key sort of Korean, Japanese brand you might uncover out the blue. Um, and then you have your little hat on. So you would end up looking like those guys, right? You end up either looking like you graph, you have some sort of graffiti, right? You're going to do some throw up somewhere or uh, you got like a sick hand style or you're going to be looking like one of these flipping, you know, scrubs that hands around the flipping shoreditch and shit or rolling up their own cigarettes and telling you about some set they listen to on nts at 8am in the morning like this is definitely the kind of person that wears this sort of stuff but again i like it man i like it i can't deny it i have to kind of take it back salomon xt4 advance and when they're meant to come out um they retail for 165 pounds though they're not cheap brother um let's see if they're actually available at matches i actually haven't checked this well, 165 pounds is no real thing to scoff at. The name is a bit bad, isn't it? Solomon, Salomon XT4 Advanced. That. Some of the names these trainer companies give their um, models is pretty odd. Loads of sizes available. Full size one. It's interesting though, right? The moment something isn't worn by a particular person it's because i always say the the person i kind of always have to keep an eye on and make sure if you wear something i just don't wear it is someone like an asap rocky he's annoying i remember i kept saying it but he's got such influence it's fucking annoying it's really annoying him and travis scott i remember i've got a pair of i've got a pair of converses now right i've got those um what i get i've got those denim tier converses with the flipping um black power flag thing on it you know you know what i mean right um and those are the first pairs of converses I've actually bought because obviously my feet are quite wide and quite long. So they don't really suit those shoes because, you know, I've always been a Vans guy and Vans start hurting me. And usually I imagine converses are a little bit more skinnier, but then the vintage pairs of converses have a little bit more of a wider toe box. I thought, you know what, let me give it a go. But I still did buy a half a size up, which might be a mistake in the long run because they do seem a little bit baggy, a little bit loose. Don't get me wrong, baggy, loose. But I bought them, right? I got them. And then what I've recognized is that I remember prior to that, I was also eyeing up a pair of Converse Lowe's with the sort of flame pattern. So I've got like a fire pattern on the side and I think they were blue, like a blue flame. And they looked really nice. They went on sale on Goodhood. I was looking at them for a while, keeping my eye on them. And then suddenly they all sold out. It was a full size one available on Goodhood. Then I went on the next day and they completely sold out. What the fuck happened? Happened to go on Instagram. I check out um, that's, um, that meme page, whatever, the guy that puts up all the style quotes and, you know, he really hates Drake. What's his name? Um, who is Celebrity Vice, right? Um, who is Celebrity Vice on Instagram? Really good site. You, you check it out. I think it's private, but if you request it, he'll definitely make sure to approve you. I think so. Sometimes people approve, but because he kind of goes on rants about people in the industry. I'm not too sure who he is, but he's a really good page. And then he posts up an image of ASAP Rocky going to, I don't know, somewhere, and he's got the fucking shoes on. I was like, oh, no wonder they sold out then. There's like a couple of days prior to that. I was like, fuck, man. So that picture definitely circulated around all the same you know pages like hidden all this sort of shit and then everyone bought out the shoes so it can be annoying but the good thing about it is that if it, no one of that if no one of that crew is wearing the stuff you can most probably pick them up really easily so because no one in that crew is, drop, is dropping Solomon you know Ian Connors in jail he's not wearing new stuff anymore at the moment Esa Barry is doing you know what he's doing now and just wearing anything that's got a pattern he just slaps it on so you know there's a lot of scope to kind of pick out your thing and you know dodge all the dodge all the sold out bits here and there and dodge looking like some trendy hype beast but i i like them man i like them and i'm again i'm happy that a full size one exists but maybe it's because of retail price i don't think so because people still buy triple s's and shit so that doesn't make any sense but i like that they're available in a full size run there full size run 165 solomon xt 4s uh, very grateful. Hopefully, I'm not. It's a bad permission. And a couple of days later, we're gonna see Rocky wear them, and they're gonna be sold out again. But yeah, so far so good. So far so good. Next on the list here, ah, we have this courtesy of Hype Beast, Carhartt Whip and Le Leart de Automobile Le Automobile Le Art de Automobile, the what the art of the car, right? Launches first ever Carhartt collaboration. Carhartt. 
So this is the following Carhartt Whip and Arthur Cars Paris based lifestyle and auto brand dealer Le Art de Automobile have announced their first ever collaboration titled Carhartt. Who is this Arthur Car? Is that, that's obviously one of Virgil's friends that loves buying vintage stuff and has his own little showroom museum, whatever he has. But is he kind of the son of some oil tycoon or some arms dealer or something? Has he, how does a regular person get a hold of these, you know, um, 99. Uh, these early 90s uh, Porsches and all this sort of shit and souped up BMWs and all this sort of, and Alfa Romeos. Who gets all this stuff? Is it, do you have to be a regular person or is again, like I said, is he the son of some sort of oil baron? But then again, it has to be said, like I always say, Virgil Abloh might be the greatest friend um, anyone could have in fashion, point blank. Anyone that comes within his orbit gets a career. You get a career, you get a career, you get a career, you get a brand, you get a brand right you get consultancy you get a firm you get an agency everybody everybody gets a look that's one of his superpowers you can think what you want to think about his designs and some of the stuff that he says in interviews and his word salad things whatever he does on his captions whatever you want to say whatever you want to say undeserving of a sport i love you to say what you want but the one thing about virgil he is not stingy of his platform he is not stingy of his clout right he's the most opposite of that when it comes to clout he gives it out he retweets people on his flipping instagram stories he shares good stuff that he likes online he's tagging people like he's he goes above and beyond to make sure that everyone that comes in his orbit or comes close to him gets as much of a shine off of what he's doing you know as as possible and i love the fact that when he's doing his shows he's always tagging his friends bringing them into a showroom and making it he basically kind of purposely because from what I've done, again, from the little I've done in fashion and from little I've done in streetwear, I know how important it is for, to have certain looks, right? To be standing certain places, to be seen at certain events, to have your name tagged on certain things, to be sent certain stuff. Like, it's very important for perception. And it also allows you just to make some money, right? To get those corporate sponsors and those brands to come in and maybe, you know, allow you to kind of improve your production. Like, for instance, look at Heron Preston. Heron Preston was always going to be a success, I think, because he's a bit of a hustler. I met him years ago in new york and he always kind of had a very entrepreneurial mindset he was always kind of getting after it kind of took after what aaron bondroff did with the new york thing never not working turn your lifestyle into a job um you know so and so lifestyle, lifestyle into a job whatever that phrase used to use right he really took that to heart and did everything he could to make sure that he kind of was living this creative entrepreneurial design-led life but most of the kind of success he's had so far has been because you know virgil tapped him in with the new guards group to do his production of his brand and now look at him he's doing everything he was doing prior but now at a higher level right he's producing capsule collections he's you know doing footwear now at the moment like loads of cool stuff is occurring because of that association with virgil and again this brand might not go anywhere right this this brand he's got where he put the emblazers cars and stuff onto stuff i've always been a bit skeptical about wearing um clothing based on kind of honoring or paying a homage to certain automobiles especially when you don't own them i look at that whole lamborghini and supreme thing i guess lamborghini the brand is bigger than what the car is but it just seems a bit corny to be like sitting on a bus somewhere wearing a lamborghini supreme t-shirt you know what i mean it just fills me with dread but again like i said virgil still is the greatest trend you could have in streetwear or in fashion it continues here it says for his collection cars inspired by carl webb's detroit heritage and carhartt's inks early history and producing his own car his own cars, really. They produced their own car in 1911. Carhartt combines uh, design sensibilities of Carhartt Whip and uh, our type of staples as a young man. Oh, look, he's doing the old bluff, isn't it? He's giving him a bit of PR to rewrite the narrative. Here we go. As a young man, Carr said uh, he skipped school to help his father fix cars. What, cars of rich oil barons or his own cars? Um, he was constantly surrounded by his classic mechanic uniform. The collection takes on Carr's fondest memories, reworking a Michigan coat and single knee pant to the capsule's green palette. The capsule is complete with functioning mini wrench keychain branded with Le Art de Auto Le Automobile. Um, is that how you pronounce it? Le Art de Le Art de Le Automobile. Le Art, I don't know how you pronounce it. The capsule's green color tones act as a nod to the forests of Lebanon. <laughs> the green is my forest in Lebanon. The white is from the purity of my mom's eyes. Uh, or when she was, you know, sprinkling flipping flour on the surface in the morning when she was cooking bread, uh, you know, the night after my dad elbowed her in the eye. <laughs> uh, the question is rounded out with two graphic tees, a slew of accessories, gadgets, including a Naglan water bottle, two cups, 
Each features an exclusive car art motif. Yep, definitely when you go into a garage, you see someone with a plastic bottle, don't you? Uh, car Hot Whip and Automobile Collab is set to release in the US on February 27th. In stores in Los Angeles and online on the whatever that date is, starting from February 25th. The little video here, let's play a bit of that. Hope he hasn't got no copyrighted music in it. Come on, play. Play! Oh, God. Why is not playing? Why are you not playing? Come on, let's go to the web, car website. See, it. maybe it's not playing on there because it's a. Uh, it want it kind of wants to push you over there, right? Let's see. Yeah, there we go. There's a bit. Let's see what it says. Don't have any copyright music, please. Don't have any copyright music, please. Don't have a copyright music, please. Let's see here. It's a video here somewhere, right? Skip, skip, skip. The stuff looks good, I think. Okay, wrong one. That's the one here. This is the video. Do I have any copyright music, please? Okay, cool. Oh, Brodinski made it. Okay, nice. Yeah, man, it's cool. It's I, you know, I get it. It's good. Like I said, man, get next to Virgil, be a millionaire. So let's, let's skip the slideshow here. Let's see what they got. The jacket looks pretty decent, not going to lie. Um, but again, you know, car jackets are flipping staples. They always look good. You can you can basically put a bit, you know, put a shit emoji and it'll look decent too. I like the t-shirt. The cap is quite nice. Yeah, it's decent. Don't get me wrong. It's quite good. I'm not going to lie. It's quite nice. That's screen printed on though, right? It's not, embroid it's not embroidered. So that will probably end up peeling off over time. I'm sure they've maybe improved their process in terms of screen printing on such a canvasy material but i'm not really you know i don't know about that and a little it's funny isn't it the kind of working class themes that kind of run through a lot of the streetwear brands right the kind of um uh what is it from working class sort of like manual labor sort of thing going on when the majority of kids are wearing this sort of shit haven't seen a wrench in their entire life don't know what a screwdriver is probably can't even change the tire on their own bicycle if it goes flat do you know what i mean but there's this kind of obsession with having you know um what do you call it like fire you know brigade uniforms police uniform tactical vest like you know stuff that builders would wear there is this kind of tactile wanting to get back to the core of what it means to be a man hero's journey sort of shit but really like i said day in day out these kids are just on their phone you know installing bots on computers all over the world and buying up all the edge Jordan ones in, in existence and then getting their parents fired that's what they're into that's what they're really really into yeah, it looks pretty decent. I'm not going to lie, man. It looks decent. It looks cool. But like I said, if this didn't exist, would anyone care? Probably not. But again, stand next to Virgil. Be a millionaire. He is the greatest friend anyone could ever have. This is what I mean. If, if anyone's turned... If anyone stabbed this guy in the back, you definitely deserve some time in hell because he helps out everybody. But again, check it out if you're that way inclined. It is there. Carhartt. Carhartt. Have you actually pronounced that? Check it out if you're that way inclined. What else do we have here? I think that might be it, you know? Yeah, that might be it. That might be it for now. Uh, uh, that's it for now. Let's just pause it for the yeah, I think that's it. Anyway, that's the Axion Zing Show episode number 440, right? Yeah, thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time checking out the show, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five star review and share the show. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Until then, take care, be safe. Peace.